Okay, so we're going to talk about photosynthesis today. And photosynthesis, if you look at the just the term photosynthesis, photo means light and synthesis means to make. So we're using light, plant cells use light to make sugar. And that's the simple way of explaining it to a, you know, like are you smarter than a fifth grader, right? The simple way of saying photosynthesis is using light to make energy. And the energy is stored in carbohydrates. So the simplest sugar is like glucose is made in plant cells using light energy. And you know, if you think about that, all the organisms and life that we have on Earth depends on this process because we can't sit out in the sun and get our energy. So we need these autotrophs, they're called autotrophs, organisms that can make their own sugar using sunlight energy, right? Radiant energy, taking radiant energy and converting it into chemical energy is what happens in cells. So plants need that sugar themselves to grow. That's where the energy for making ATP for growth and development in the plant cell occurs. But then when we eat the plant cells, we get that sugar. But we don't get as much of the sugar as the plant does, right? Because we always lose some as we go down the chain. So you can see within the, what organelle does this photosynthesis occur? Chloroplast. In chloroplasts. So in chloroplasts, we make this glucose, but what is the requirement? If you look at this little flow chart here, what is required to make that glucose? What does the plant cell need from the outside? Sunlight energy, we already talked about. That's what the little arrows are here. What else do you see going into that chloroplast? Carbon dioxide, yeah. So carbon dioxide is part of the process. It's a, it's a requirement for photosynthesis. And where do we find carbon dioxide? It's in the atmosphere, but how does it get there? Yes? Yeah, metabolism. Cell metabolism releases carbon dioxide in the air. So when we break down glucose in our cells, we, re we break down the glucose molecule and release carbon dioxide to the air. So it's kind of a nice arrangement. The plants use the carbon dioxide to make glucose and oxygen, and we use the oxygen to make the carbon dioxide. So it's this cycle that feeds itself. It's very efficient that way. So the requirements for photosynthesis are sunlight, carbon dioxide, and what else? What else is in our breath? Our breath has carbon dioxide in it, our exhale. Water. We learned that when we were skiing this week. It was so cold out that the, the water vapor from our exhale would just soak your mask. If you've ever been outside snowmobiling and it gets all wet right there, that was probably the most uncomfortable part of it was that wet on my face the whole time. But so water and carbon dioxide are required for photosynthesis to take and the sunlight energy. And if we look at the other organelle that produced the carbon dioxide and water, what is that yellow organelle at the bottom of the diagram here? You remember the organelle that makes energy for cells? Yeah, the mitochondria. So the mitochondria produce the carbon dioxide and the water for photosynthesis to use. So we're going to talk about this week photosynthesis, which occurs in the chloroplast of plant cells. And then we're going to talk about cellular respiration that occurs in the mitochondria of all eukaryotes, whether it's plant or animal. Remember, bacteria don't have organized organelles. They still undergo the cell metabolism, but they do it in a little different way. Okay, so glucose and oxygen are what's produced. So you could put that little note over here on the right side of your notes. Produced. This is what we get from ph photosynthesis. And this is required. So carbon dioxide and water are what's required for photosynthesis. It's really important you know the difference between the two. What's required? What's produced? So again, autotrophs, all organisms need energy. Plant cells do too, but plant cells can make their own energy through the sunlight and making that glucose. Autotrophs make their own food and get their own energy. Auto means self, like automobile means self-propelling, right? Put some gas in, you don't need to haul it with horses. So photoautotrophs are those that use sunlight to make their own energy. Because we're going to find there's chemoautotrophs, some Organisms that use chemicals to make energy. I'm not going to talk a lot about those, but the photoautotrophs we're going to talk a lot about. So plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. So 
So those are special bacteria that have the pigments necessary for photosynthesis. And most photosynthesis occurs among the algae the, and the cyanobacteria. They're the largest producers of the oxygen we have in the atmosphere. So what does that tell you? Which type of landscape is most important? Where do we find cyanobacteria? Well, algae. Where do we find algae? Water. In the water. So that's why it's so hugely important we protect our waterways. Because if we damage our waterways with pollution, then we destroy the photosynthetic abilities of the organisms in that water and that affects the atmosphere. So it's hugely important that we protect our waterways. And that was part of Earth Day of this year, or I'm sorry, it's the new year. Last year, 2018, was all about protecting our oceans. And then heterotrophs, we call consumers. So the autotrophs are the producers. They produce the energy and the carbohydrate. And heterotrophs consume that energy, consume those carbohydrates. So we need to get our energy from eating food and cellular respiration or autotrophs rely on photosynthesis. So this is the full reaction that you should know for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water with light energy involved creates glucose and oxygen gas. And you need to know the balance formula. So sometimes it's just easy to write it like 10 times without looking. Now kind of cement it in your brain of where the twos and the sixes go, the twelves. But if I look at the number of oxygen atoms to the left of the arrow, so there's two on carbon dioxide and there's times six, that's twelve. And then there's just one oxygen times six with that coefficient. So we have twelve plus six is eighteen. If I add that up over here, six plus 12, I get 18 on the right side. So we don't lose or gain atoms, we just rearrange them. We break bonds and form bonds. And that releases energy and we store energy. So in the case of glucose, when we form glucose, we're storing energy in the bonds of glucose. So when we run it through our digestive tract, we break those bonds and we release that energy. So that's chemical energy. So the left side of the arrow, this is we're taking light energy and converting it into the bonds of glucose. And that's where that energy is stored, ready to be used by us, and releasing that oxygen gas. So part of our um, lab on photosynthesis is looking at oxygen production by the leaves. Because if you notice here, the leaves are where photosynthesis occurs because that's what's exposed to the light and it has a nice big surface area. So as they produce oxygen, we'll see these little bubbles form on the surface of the leaf and then they rise to the top. So that's oxygen being produced as a result of photosynthesis. But again, we have to have good light for that to occur. So where does it take place? We already said in the leaf. I wanted you to look at your diagram that I handed out. I'm going to pull it up online so I can look at it with you. Structures of the leaf. Come on. You got this nice diagram here. So let's just identify some basic structures. So when we talk about what's happening with photosynthesis, you have some background. So the first layer, this top layer, is called the cuticle. And it's a waxy, protective layer. So that yellow layer on the top is the cuticle. And it's waxy, protective, waterproofing. Because we don't want to see a lot of water loss through a plant. We see some of that. It's called transpiration. But we don't want to see a lot of water loss. So that's a waxy, waterproof, protective covering called the cuticle. And then the next layer of cells is called the upper epidermis. So the next layer, these flattened cells here, this is the upper epidermis. And that too provides um, protection. It's full of cellulose, it gives strength and, and structure to the plant, holds the, the leaves 
nice and open and gives it some turgor, water pressure, and that central vacuole is full of water and keeps it open so the, so the leaves don't wilt and, and droop. So that's the upper epidermis. And then the lower epidermis is here. It's on the underside of the leaf. And the job of the lower epidermis is gas exchange with the outside air. I'll talk about those special structures there. So that's the lower up ep epidermis, provides some protection again, but also gas exchange. So there's these openings. So the opening here for this right here, this is called a stoma. A stoma is an opening. Just like in healthcare, people that have had a tracheostomy, they have like, you have to make an incision here and put a breathing tube there, and sometimes you'll see the scar there still. That's called a stoma, any opening. Person that has a colonoscopy or has a colostomy, they have a stoma, which is the opening. So this hole is a is that stoma is where carbon dioxide enters into the leaf. Because we said carbon dioxide was a requirement for photosynthesis, so it enters in through that stoma. And there's two cells on either side of that stoma that protect that opening. Sometimes it closes, sometimes it opens, depends on the time of the day and the water availability inside and outside the plant. So they're called guard cells. So the cells on either side of the stoma are called guard cells. And they control the opening and closing of the stoma. So that's what this little line is here. It's pointing to that little cell there called guard cells. So stoma. If we have more than one stoma, we call it stomata. So the plural for stoma is stomata. If you want to add that on your worksheet where it says stoma, just put in parentheses, you know, plural is stomata. All right, then we have the vein which is right here, this rounded structure here is a vein, the whole thing, so you could label that right here. That special little symbol there means this whole thing, that's a vein. And that is for transport up the stem, and down, up and down the stem, is for transport. So what do we need to transport through the vein? What do we need to transport? What needs to come up to the leaf for photosynthesis? Water. water. So water transport. And then also if we think about where energy is stored, sometimes energy is stored in the root, isn't it? Like a carrot. Isn't all that energy in the carrot, not in the leaves? So that energy has to the food that's made in the leaves has to go down the stem to be stored. So we have food going one direction. So we have carbohydrate going down the stem. And then we have water coming up the stem through the veins, just like our veins, right? Carry nutrients and gases. All right, then we have air spaces. And where's the arrow that points to the air space? You might need to add an arrow. So I would add an arrow just anywhere in here in between. So these, this layer here, these cells that are pointed to here, so this line here is called the spongy, spongy mesophyll, spongy mesophyll. And the space between those cells is just the air space. So you could, you know, Draw an arrow to any space between these spongy mesophyll and just write air space. So what do you think that's for? What do we need the air space for? Yes. to give support, possibly, but what gases are in the air that might be found here? 
Yeah, carbon dioxide and oxygen are in this airspace, right? So if, for example, it's um, the stomata are closed, depending on the time of the day, we can still have some uh, carbon dioxide available to the plant because there are these air spaces that will store excess carbon dioxide. So that's the function of the airspace, is just to store excess gases, either carbon dioxide or oxygen. And then we have the pal palisade mesophyll, which is all across the top. So that's what this one is pointing to, the palisade mesophyll. This whole layer is called mesophyll. And these cells are green, and why do you think they're green? What do they contain? Chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, very good. And what organelle? Chloroplasts. Chloroplasts, yep. So this is, these are the workers. This is where the active photosynthesis is occurring, is in that palisade mesophyll layer. So there's some um, photosynthesis occurring in the spongy mesophyll, but it's really packed in that palisade layer. That's where it's see the most chloroplasts. Where was the in this case, it's this small. Point to it on here. The lower epidermis is this line here. It's referring to this whole layer here. So this is lower epidermis. And this here, again, would be what? This lower arrow. Cuticle, yep. So you can tell the difference, and we're going to look at these in, in lab as well. You can tell the difference between the upper and lower <coughs> epidermis by looking for what structures? What? The stomata with the guard cells. We only find those on the lower epidermis. Okay, so I think we had defined everything there. Now we're going to go to the next page and look at the structure of a chloroplast. Spongy mesophyll didn't have a specific function, function, some photosynthesis. You can say some photosynthesis and just contains air spaces. So they're just a little more randomly arranged, those um, cells, those plant cells. So this is an organ of a, of a plant, right? This is the leaf, made up of several different tissue types, which is different cells working together. So these are all plant cells, whether it's epidermis or spongy mesophyll, palisade mesophyll. These are all plant cells. So they have the structures that we looked at for today's, you know, for, for the last unit. We talked about cell structure and function. These are all plant cells. A little different arrangement, a little different, you know, location in the plant, but they're all plant cells, but they have a specific function in the plant. The typical plant cell, though, is in the spongy, or I'm sorry, is in the palisade mesophyll. Like a typical plant cell that does its thing, does photosynthesis, that's where it's located. Like the model we have in class, that would be a good example of a cell pulled from palisade mesophyll. Okay. So looking at this organelle, the whole organelle is called a, you can just title the top of this page as what? What do you think? Chloroplast. Chloroplast. Yep, yeah, it's a chloroplast. So the chloroplast has some specific parts. We have just the membrane of the chloroplast. It doesn't have any fancy name, just the membrane. There's an inner and outer membrane. But the, the fluid inside here, the fluid inside, just kind of random, is called stroma. Not stoma, not right at an R, stroma. There's the fluid inside the chloroplast. And there's lots of enzymes for one of the reactions of photosynthesis. So this line here is stroma, the fluid inside the chloroplast. So that's this bottom line here. And then we have these sacs, these membranous sacs that kind of fold in on each other. Each of these is called a thylakoid membrane. Thylakoid 
membrane or thylakoid. Each individual little membrane is called a thylakoid. That's this one here. You don't have to do functions for this yet because that's going to really come in in the next handout. And then a stack of thylakoids, a stack of them we called a granum, G-R-A-N-U-M, a stack of thylakoids. So you could probably predict there's going to be a diagram, right, on the next test where you have to label all these good things. So it's a lot of vocabulary, just practicing with the terminology. So a stack of thylakoids is granum. So this is where all the action is. So now when we watch the process of photosynthesis, we'll be able to understand some of the terminology of where those structures are. And then big picture, looking at, you know, how the plant works together with all of its part to stay alive. We already said that water enters the leaf through the veins. And the carbohydrates go throughout the plant through the veins. So the job of photosynthesis is to take the energy from the sun, convert it into a carbohydrate. We talked about carbon dioxide enters the leaf through the stomata, through those holes in the lower epidermis. So the function of roots then, so let's just write this below. The function of roots is to bring what for photosynthesis? What? Nutrients from the soil as well as what's the most important thing for photosynthesis though? water. So the water comes up to the roots and it comes up by cohesion and adhesion. Remember how we talked about water molecules being sticky and they, are, they kind of pull each other in a string up the stem as water is lost through the leaves because it evaporates through the leaves. Um, so through the, through the roots and then the stems are the regions, is the area for transport, right? Water and food Carbohydrate travel up and down. Water goes up, food comes down. So the stem main job is support and transport. So support just means it gives something to hold the leaves upright and exposed to the sun, right? If we had a bad stem, the leaves would be laying on the ground. So the stem provides support and structure for the plant, supports the leaves, and then it's for transport of nutrients and water. And then we already said the leaves, the job of the leaves are photosynthesis, right? So that's where photosynthesis occurs, is in the leaves. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a general overview of photosynthesis before we get into the nitty-gritty details. So we're going to watch an animation on photosynthesis, but just remember... Um, takes place in the green portions of the plant because we need that chlorophyll. Chlorophyll has the green pigment, or has a green pigment. So in the mesophyll tissue we already talked about, here's the reaction. So water, roots absorb water, and they go up the veins of the plant. Carbon dioxide enters through the leaf through the stomata on the lower epidermis like we talked about. And then we're going to talk about how that carbon dioxide and water come together in the stroma, which is that fluid portion of the chloroplast. So we're going to go through the different stages of photosynthesis. And there's some terminology that you should be familiar with, and that is oxidation reduction reactions. And it's basically the transferring of electrons from one substance to another. So electrons are the energy particle. Remember we studied that in the beginning of the semester, that um, atoms gain or lose energy when they gain or lose electrons. So if a molecule gains an electron, typically it's in the form of hydrogen. Because how many electrons does hydrogen have? If it has an atomic number of one, how many electrons does it have? One. So we use the term hydrogen atoms in these reactions, but we're referring to electrons. So if something gains hydrogen, it gains energy. If it loses hydrogen, it loses energy. Okay, so try to just remember that. Loss of hydrogen, loss of energy, gain of hydrogen, gain of energy.
So if something gains hydrogen, we say that that molecule has been reduced, which kind of goes opposite to our thinking, right? If you think of reduced, you think of losing energy, but actually it means gaining energy in chemistry. So if something is reduced, it gained hydrogen. If it's oxidized, it lost hydrogen and lost energy. Another little mnemonic that I've used is Leo the lion goes grr. Leo is lose electrons, lose energy, oxidation. Leo, L-E-O, lose electrons, oxidation. Ger, G-E-R, gain electrons, oxidation. No, did I just say that? No. Ger is G-E-R, gain electrons, reduction, right? G-E-R, gain electrons, gain energy, reduction. So here we're looking at this molecule, NAD+. Plus. It gained what? It gained hydrogen atom, a hydrogen atom. So therefore, what would we say happened to this molecule? Was it oxidized or reduced? Reduced. Reduced. Too good. And then this, we would say, was... oxidized, right, because it lost hydrogen. So those are some terms you're going to see in this video we're going to watch that talks about oxidation and reduction. Okay, so if we look at the reaction for um, cellular respiration, for example, this is when we take glucose and break it down into energy. Glucose loses hydrogen atoms, so glucose is oxidized to become carbon dioxide. And oxygen gains hydrogen atoms, so we say that it's reduced to become water. So, so when you talk about hydrogen, it's carrying electrons. It's all about the hydrogen atoms. So these are coenzymes, we call them, that help out photosynthesis or cellular respiration. We're going to be talking about these three, NAD+, NADP+, and FAD+. Talking about those in photosynthesis and cellular respiration, which is next week's topic. Okay, so we're going to start off looking at photosynthesis, the light reactions. And they're called the light reactions because they can only do this when there's sunlight or some source of UV light provided, because you can have you know, an internal plant light too. So these require light, these reactions require light to energize the process. And we'll talk about that in detail here now. So I'm going to go to this animation here. So I gave you this handout. Um, it's in Blackboard. It's called Photosynthesis Review. And you're going to fill this out as the animation proceeds. Yes? I need that handout. You need one? I have sound here. Which I don't. Now I will. In order for plants to grow, they need inputs of carbon dioxide, water, and energy. The chemical process by which plants use these resources to manufacture glucose, the building blocks of plants, is called photosynthesis. In the process, oxygen gas is produced as a byproduct. The energy for photosynthesis originates in the sun and arrives at the earth as sunlight. This light has both a wave and a particle nature. The particles, or photons, are the smallest units of light. Photons oscillate along a path, which is measured as wavelengths. Okay, so... Number one, photosynthesis involves an energy that originates from the and yields what? Oxygen as a byproduct. The smallest units of light are 
photons, the spelling is up there, and they oscillate, which means they move up and down on a path called wavelengths. The light emitted from the sun contains photons in a wide spectrum of wavelengths called the electromagnetic spectrum. So part of that spectrum contains visible light that we can see and other light that we can't see. So this little tiny Roy G. Biv, right? Everybody remembers that? You know, I didn't learn that until like my senior year in high school. Someone was saying, Roy G. Biv, what does that mean? No one's ever taught me that. Colors in the rainbow, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. That's visible light. It's pretty narrow, right? Of the whole spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, this is the part that we can see. The other ones are what we use for different purposes, right? X-rays, gamma rays, and that's dangerous that you know can cause cancer, penetrate walls. X-rays do not. UV light, we know, is helpful, it stimulates vitamin D, so we can assume that also contribute to cancer. And radio waves are okay, infrared not damaging to skin, but that's the energy spectrum. So obviously the closer these are together, the higher the frequency, the more energy in those waves. Photosynthetic organisms use only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. Photosynthetic organisms contain pigments that facilitate the capture of wavelengths of light in the visible light range. The color of the pigment comes from the wavelengths of light reflected. Plants appear green because they reflect yellow and green wavelengths of light. Red and blue wavelengths of light are absorbed by these pigments and provide the energy that is used for photosynthesis. With okay, let's pause that. So number four, photosynthetic organisms use a small portion of spectrum called visible light. And what helps capture that light? Number five, what is it called? Pigments. pigments, yep, pigments. And chlorophyll is one of those pigments. And the color of the pigment represents, represents the color of the wavelength that is reflected, reflected by the plant. So if I look across this room right now, what I'm seeing as your shirt color or your eye color is what is reflected, is what that wavelength is reflected back. And that's what looks as the color, the absorbed colors we don't see. So if a person is wearing a black sweatshirt, like Cambria is, Cambria, Cambria um, it's absorbing all colors of visible light. If you're wearing a white shirt, like Emily is kind of, sort of, um, that means all colors are being reflected back. And if you wear one in the sunlight, which one heats up faster? Black, because it's absorbing all that energy, all that light energy. And what, what kind of cars do they drive down south where it's hot all the time? Did you ever notice that? Look at the color of the cars. We were in Arizona a couple weekends ago. What color are the cars down there? Yeah, all lighter colors. A lot of white cars and a lot of that silvery, light gray silver. Yeah, because that reflects the light and reflects the heat, too. It doesn't absorb. You don't drive black cars down in Florida and Texas where there's a lot of sun. Okay, so green plants reflect. Let's look back at the picture here. Green plants reflect. Ah, oops. Just missing that picture. There we go. So green plants reflect... What colors? Green and yellow. And what do they absorb? Yep, red and blue. Red and blue wavelengths of light are absorbed by these pigments and provide the energy that is used for photosynthesis. So the blue and red wavelengths of light are where the energy is for stimulating. We're going to see these photosystems in the leaf of the thylakoid membrane. Within eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, also known as photoautotrophs, 
the chemical reactions of photosynthesis occur within plant cells in specialized structures known as chloroplasts. Photosynthesis consists of two sets of reactions, the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. So the organisms are called yep, photoautotrophs. And the reactions occur in, nope, no, more specifically, organelles are chloroplasts, yep. And the reaction names, did you catch those? Yep, very good. Light dependent and Calvin cycle. Within the chloroplast are small disc like structures called thylakoids, which are surrounded by a fluid filled space called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose in the Calvin cycle occur in the stroma. The light dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid. It is here that conversion of light energy to chemical energy is initiated. In most photosynthetic. So we're zeroing in on those membranous sacs in the chloroplast called the thylakoid. And these cool little green things are part of the chlorophyll pigment, and they're called photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. So I'll save you the, the time. Number 9, they're called photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. So what are these things here? Do you remember this from when we studied plasma membrane structure? Phospholipids, yep. So these are proteins embedded in the membrane. Like we said, proteins are all about structure and function of the membrane, right? Okay, so let's watch. And again, this is the, the leaf. This is the mesophyll. Organisms. Organisms. Thylakoids contain pairs of photosystems called photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 that work in tandem to produce the energy that will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. So photos number 9, photosystem 1 and 2 to make energy. It's all about the energy. Yep. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecule... So molecules that absorb photo photons of light are... molecules of... Did you catch that? Let's watch it again. ...will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll, the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. So the molecules that absorb the photons of light are chlorophyll. Yep. And the absorbed light energy excites what? Electrons. Photosystems will channel the excitation of the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. Photosystems will channel the excitation energy gathered by the pigment molecules to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which will... So a reaction center chlorophyll molecule for number 11. So electrons are passed to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which is at a higher level of energy. Then, then pass the electrons to a series of proteins located on the thylakoid membrane. So they're passed to proteins on the thylakoid membrane. All right. Photons of light strike photosystems 1 and 2 simultaneously. We will examine what happens with the photons striking photosystem 2 first.
The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem 2 to an electron transport chain. The electrons lost by photosystem 2 are replaced by a process called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem 2 to an electron transport chain. The electrons lost by photosystem 2 are replaced by a process called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. So photolysis, if we look at the reverse of that, lysis means to break and you're breaking it with light. So these are water molecules. So essentially, we're breaking a water molecule and releasing the hydrogen atoms, right, H2O for water, and oxygen gas. Let's just watch that again. It's called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. So there's the hydrogen atoms broken apart. There's the electron going one way and these protons from the hydrogen atom going another way. And then there's the oxygen gas, O2, right? So number 13, in photosystem 2, electrons lost by photosynthesis, photosystem 2 are replaced by photolysis, which results in oxidation of a water molecule, producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this oxygen gas is a byproduct of photosynthesis, it is an important input to the cellular respiration pathways. As electrons pass through the electron transport chain, the energy from the electron is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma to the thylakoid, creating a concentration gradient. So energy from the electrons passing down the electron chain, so it's moving down the membrane, these series of electrons, is used to pump what ions? Hydrogen ions from the stroma, which is the fluid portion, to this thylakoid membrane. This gradient powers a protein called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem 2 are shuttled to photosystem 1. Within photosystem 1, low energy electrons are re-energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP plus to NADPH. All right, let's stop with that. So we're at number 16. Do we get 15? Are we okay with 15? Okay. So we're taking this, we're trying to fuel this pump on the membrane. Under the thylakoid, creating a concentration gradient. This gradient powers a protein called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. So this pump here it's called, the, it's called the ATP synthase pump, right here. This is called the ATP synthase pump, and it's fueled by hydrogen ions. So all these little pluses here are hydrogen ions that are built up in the stroma, and it fuels this pump to make ATP, because we're going to need energy for the next set of reactions, and this <coughs> provides that energy. So that was number 16, hydrogen ion to power a protein called the ATP synthase pump. S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. Called ATP synthase 
which, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem 2 are shuttled to photosystem 1. Within photosystem 1, low energy electrons are re energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP plus to NADPA. So this just gained a hydrogen atom, right? So therefore, was it energized, which we say, was it reduced, or was it oxidized, where energy was taken away from the molecule? Which of the following would be correct? We added a hydrogen, so we added electrons, gained energy, and we're going to need that energy because we're going to deliver that energy in the next set of reactions. So NADP plus, so we reduced NADP plus to NADPH for number 18. We made this, NADPH, and that's a coenzyme that's necessary for photosynthesis. Yeah. So here's the whole process happening at once. When the chloroplast is receiving a steady supply of photons, NADPH and ATP molecules. So NADPH and ATP are the two energy molecules needed for this next process. So here's ATP and NADPH that are produced as a result of the light reactions. So that's number 19. And they're going to fuel the... are, are rapidly being provided to the metabolic pathways in the stroma. stroma. Therefore, the ATP and NADPH formed during the light-dependent reactions are used in the stroma to fuel the Calvin cycle reactions. So for number 19, it's fueling the Calvin cycle. And we're just going to actually back up and finish number 20. The goal of, car of the Calvin cycle is to reduce what to G3P? Carbon dioxide. And we'll pick up next time talking about the Calvin cycle. So